Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the CAD platform. Our evening's topic will be Unmasking Deaf Studies, Implications of Whiteness as at the Epicenter. Our presenter this evening is Lindsay Dunn. Welcome to the CAD platform. All right. Let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I was born and raised in South Africa. I became deaf at the age of 10. And my deafness was caused by spinal meningitis. I was raised in various schools. I went to uh, deaf schools, um, school for the deaf for five years, and I was mainstreamed with no interpreter. I don't know what you call that, pretty much mainstreamed. Then I graduated from a hearing school and then went on to Gallaudet University to get my bachelor's degree and my master's. And then went on to New York University to get my graduate degree in deaf education and rehab counseling. At 15 years of age, I joined the BCM, Black, consciousness movement. As you can see with BLM, I had joined the BCM back then. It was an organization that was established, but it was challenging with the various systems because black political organizations were uh, not allowed and, and as well. But at 15, I got involved and was quite actively involved. The title, I'm Asking Deaf Studies, came to me during the COVID crisis back in this last spring. I really started to begin and think and ponder what does this really mean? How can we grab this opportunity and have a discussion of an important topic in regards to oppression? I started with the colonization of black deaf humans. Oftentimes people will ask the question, are you serious? Black, deaf, slaves? And the answer is yes, obviously. The first school for the deaf was in uh, 1986. It was during the reconstruction time. It was 12 years after the Civil War ended wherein black people took control of their lives. They set up businesses, churches, schools, and so forth. Some of them were elected. It was the golden age for the deaf com or the black community. So that was in 1969. So what was before that? There were still uh, slaves that were in ex existence at the School for the Deaf. They were living in slavery. American black people were uh, finally emancipated in 1862. 
and set free. Colonization of black deaf humans? Yes. Because as a black deaf person, I'm still black. The colonization is there for the European portions of the, the white race there in South Africa, South America, Asian communities, all over the world was colonization. So black deaths were uh, by POCs were also colonized. So deaf people oftentimes began history with the ASD, the American School for the Deaf, and that was founded in 1817, which was a great part of history. In 1817, that is when Frederick de Salas was born in 1817. Why is that important to me? Because that was a time period they were fighting black slaves. And then they established a school for the deaf. The American School for the Deaf has a bit of interesting history. In about 1820, the Americans were, um, were forcing the uh, Native American Indians to move out of the land. So in that Eastern states, the white people were buying up the land very cheaply. They purchased the lands and the slaves they worked the land, made monies. And then in 1820, the federal government decided to give a group of people in Hartford, Connecticut, the land that Alabama had ownership of. So they sold it to the slaves, and then they set up the school for the deaf. Remember, that was initiated in a hotel. It wasn't actually had purchased land. So they bought the land from Alabama, and they used that to establish the first school building. The interesting point is, at deaf education at that point started from the tears of the American Indians being ousted from their land and the sweat of the black slaves. That's what built the foundation for deaf education. There's a bit of history that isn't often talked about, but is a fact. In the deaf community, we have a hierarchy. Black deaf are at the bottom, the white deaf are at the top of this hierarchy. And because the uh, white deaf benefit from the ideology. So we already started at the bottom. Even though history shows that the American school was started in 1817. There were no black students at that time. The New York School for the Deaf was in 1818, and they did have black deaf students. One young boy was in the first class. And that was Oris Crawford. He entered that school year, and then the next year in 1819, a female, a black, female also entered it, entered the school, 
and that was Sally Robinson. So the two were the first black deaf students to get an education. And at that time, slavery was still prominent in America. So it was really amazing to have had two black students and then later the numbers increased. And at the American School for the Deaf, they finally had a deaf student in 1825. And that was Charles Hiller from Martha's Vineyard. So he entered the American School for the Deaf and he was the first of 12 students that Lawrence Clark taught. And that was a big hurrah for us. By 1870, there were maybe about 30, over 30 black deaf students that got an education from ASD, as well as from the New York School for the Deaf, as well as another school set up by P.H. Skinner. So altogether, we had black deaf people with educations in the slavery times. And I thought that was very valuable to understand that. But because our stories tend to be pushed away and not considered significant enough, I'm pretty sure that most of you have never heard this. If no one tells the story, then who am I? Who do I identify myself with? What is my story? Do I follow white history and their stories? Do I accept those as mine? I just can't do that. Why is that? Because one, in Spain, with Pablo Bond, he created the first system of sign language Spain colonization was there, and then they brought that over to France, and France was a colonization, and then moved on over to America, and America as well was a slave country. So that bit of history of colonization is not a part of my history, it's not my story but I seem to have to follow that because that's what colonization does. It determines what is best for me. But I question that. And it's like, you're telling me who I am? I should be able to decide who I am. History is very critical, very interesting as well, because history is controlled by whomever tells the story. The Western civilization, such as in Europe, they're dominant uh, in their writings of history. Whoever writes history controls the story. So if I write something and others view that about the other side of the story, how's that perceived? So our upbringings tend to be of one story. As an African, I learn a lot about European stories because my country is controlled by the colonization of Europe over Africa and decides what curriculum 
what religion, what politics, what economic system we need to follow. They dominate that. So it's important for us to understand that there is another side to the story, which is our by POC side, our history, our culture, our stories need to be told as well. The question is, do we have history? And I say, yes, we do. Does it matter? Is it important? Yes, it is. How do kids grow up and build self-esteem if they don't know their history or their story? They accept the white story, but something's lacking. It's not reflective of them. It doesn't apply to them. So the question is, if we accept Europeans' central history, the European story, it doesn't really resonate or reflect me. So what do I do? Who's going to tell my story? Who's going to tell our story? We as BI's POCs need to, but again, who's controlling that? Who's sending out the information on the stories? Who's in the media controlling that? Are you controlling that? You could decide if that story is worthy to pass on or not. I love reading various books. Oftentimes the books are related to deaf persons being a deaf human. And I tend to read through it, looking for something that I can connect with. I struggle to find something and then I realized academia, universities out there, professors, they've got a lot of power. They can decide how the story will be told. We need to be part of that process of telling the story. Because if we're not included, then the story will come from one side only. And that can be dangerous to have a single-sided story. So we're going to see now how situations have become in our world where people are raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm here. I exist. I'm important too. I'm a human as well. I have a story to tell. And that's going to be very important for us to develop with uh, struggling with the equalization. Racial mythology is what I call it. Racial mythology is a, your superiority and my inferiority. So here's a poem by Amy Sasser. Go ahead and take a moment to read through this. This, in summary, is talking to us about the mythology that the whites are, have a superiority and I have an inferiority. But you're forcing that identity of inferiority on me. 
So I, I envision that's not me. You decided that's me. You forced that on me. I know myself. Allow me to tell you who I am. So how do we deconstruct whiteness-centered deaf mythology? Where do we even begin? We need to unroot that ideology if we want to achieve fairness. Again, the question is, in the academia world, and outside of that as well, we need to start to analyze and ask the question, how do we change that? How do we work towards this goal and to arrive to a place of freedom and equalization, justice? Where do we begin? I can't give you that answer. I want you to think about that answer. Then hopefully we can have discussions that will happen all over that will lead to something with a more positive future. So why is it that we have black and deaf history? Why is that important? Albert Camus discusses an interesting topic, explaining that the natural indifferenceness that's placed between misery and the sun, misery kept me from believing all that as well. And that it's all good under the sun, but that's not true. Not everything is good under the sun. So again, when you're looking at history and reading history, deaf history doesn't exactly connect to me. Deaf history is about the white people who have colonized me and enslaved me. In the deaf world, it's a micronism of the total world. Micronism, what does that mean? It's a small part, but it represents the whole. So you take that small part, is it different from the worldview? No, it thinks the same way. It practices the same thing in the deaf community as the general world does. Black BIPOCs are still inferior and looked down upon. There's no difference. I think in the deaf world, we're safe. You know, we're both deaf, but not true. I wish it were true, but it's not really even true today. So then I realize I don't like having to accept that. I have to do something about it. So the opportunities are great now. We have the BLM platform. We have racism and autism. What is the purpose? of the intellectual if it cannot excuse the violence of one side and condemn that of the other and what their roles are. So I start to analyze it and as to what my role is as a higher educator at Gallaudet. What is my role? What I realize my suffering is from the supremacy of white people. Same thing with deaf white people. 
oppressing my race. And on the other side of it, hearing people or black uh, hearing people oppress me because I can't hear. So both sides are oppressing me, whether it's the hearing side and or the deaf side. That really woke me up. As a black person, who am I if both of these worlds don't understand me? Both of these communities don't accept me. It doesn't matter if they are, their oppression is intentional or not. I still need to let them know it needs to stop. I'm human. I matter. I want to be safe and feel at an equality. You can't excuse, if I excuse the white, deaf, and black hearing people that are oppressing me, it's like, no, you're still oppressing me because of my race and or the black and hearing were uh, culturally the same and history the same, but I can't excuse you because you oppress me because I can't hear. So I need to let both communities know. That's my responsibility as a black deaf person who's fortunate enough to have the privilege to have a college education. Angela Davis said, it's important not only to have the awareness and to feel impelled to become involved. But it's important also that there be a forum out there to which one can relate in an organization and a movement. So it's to dismantle this destructive ideology. Last spring with BLM, I'll discuss a little bit more on that because I know it's valuable. A lot of people are really doing something about it. There's a lot of discourse about it, black deaf people sharing our traumas, our negative experiences at the school for the deaf and in the world as a general, our pains and our hurts, and to see our angers and frustrations to have had kept all of that in and people are saying, I don't understand why you feel that way. And others were thinking, oh, okay. The black deaf community realizes that was an opportunity to share with you what it's like to be black deaf America, what our experiences are like. You as a White person don't have to realize that. It doesn't impact you the same way. You're causing the trauma to happen and you don't even think it's important to understand that. We'll switch interpreters now. So life just keeps on going on. So BLM impacts us and allows us to have discussions with white people. And some organizations at the schools, residential schools have had to apologize They said, we don't want your apology. But 
because the status quo remains the same. You still have your white privilege. We won't, we don't want to hear your apology. That system can still establish a new equality. It's not an inequality. You have to give up your house, your car. Don't stop us if we want to be the same. Last spring, that happened as well. We brought in others, black bodies, and it became a wall, and it blocked us for equality. And we wanted to keep their power and use the black bodies. It wasn't new. Colonization was designed to continue with that power. After other countries released their power, they thought, wow, are we free? No. They were still in control from colonization and becoming imperialism. It's like globalization, but the purpose of that still remains the same. It keeps our black persons down. At Gallaudet, they were doing that. And how they handled that was with the power that black persons have power as well. So maybe they were sent overseas to get their education and then run their country, but who controlled them were the colonizers. For an example, in speaking countries, you have 14 countries and you can bring in the monies in the economic system, but the money itself is kept in the central bank in Paris. So who controls that was France, kept controlling the monies. So all of the Africa's monies were based on European economy, based on the pound or the franc. And now, uh, and including the US dollar as well, with that power, So that is picking and choosing and putting that wall up and colonized. And the responsibility then falls on me that they tell me what to do. They can't go directly to the third party. It has to go through each of these steps. So from the second step, 
You have the middle class, which is an educated class. And then you have the uneducated African. And then you have a buffer to protect to protect the colonization. And so they continue with their power. I hear you now. Okay. Ready? So the organization was established, EDI, which was great, but I I really resisted it. I, I really didn't really, I didn't know what it truly meant. So let me give you an example. So how are you, as far as looking at your job description? That's one of the examples there. Your job description, you're reading over it. And it seems, you know, pretty interesting, but it doesn't necessarily say it's discriminating against the BIPOC. That's kind of the issue as far as quali being qualified for the job. Um, saying, you know, specifically, we don't have that type of training or experience, but, you know, literally there it's requested and shown there on the documents is saying that it requires a job. Of, so I'm thinking, of course, I don't understand why I would be even fired for that. There shouldn't be any type of issues with that. But then, um, of course, at that point, I say, you know, I'm going to go ahead and apply. But then they ask, well, why would you go ahead and apply for that position if you don't qualify for it? And then that is literally the issue as, as far as owning our own, as far as the discrimination and shunning us out. Literally just trying to shun us out. And then when it comes to be involved with deaf by POC individuals, literally um, being hired and saying, um, you know, asking if you need help. And I'm thinking, well, I've already explained this. You use them and they don't have the history of what we have is, is being freed. So how are they necessarily being skilled people and being able to resolve that and then being related to death issues? And that became a serious problem. And they say, it's like, how can you say that you don't do that when you still shun us away? And that is part of the system. That oppression to shun us out. And it's not necessarily welcoming, welcoming us. And we decided enough is enough. Enough is enough. But then they would use by POC bodies to cover up as far as the um, just trying to cover up the, the situation in the system. And that became really frustrating. We have been honoring and respecting those people. And what they're thinking is literally being respectful and they're not, and the reasons aren't right. And they're literally not including us. And that's not how we're freed from that. It's still oppression. Yes, it may seem like we're satisfied, but we're, what about that power? It continues as far as can being controlled, that authority over us. And that's the reason why we're really frustrated right now. working ahead. So what is left for us to do? What's the next step? First is to educate and have that discussion. 
that segregation and racism that happened in the deaf community is real. And that definitely needs to be talked about on the table, Front Street. And as far as with the institutes and in the US, the history relating to that, the oppression, Black deaf people, the individuals, our bodies, the people who are involved, your history, you set up your own school, your own history, your own ideas, literally related with white superiority. And that's, it's the same as deaf people. We are strong and, and connected, but wanting us to follow that system literally complying with the support and, and agate, agate. But then there's still oppression that happens. When it comes to the economy, looking at the world, us by POC, people are still at the bottom. What caused that inequality. How did that even happen? What was the system that was set up and established to even have that continue with your superior, with your superior thoughts and ways and still oppressing others? We really need to discuss that. Both sides, the white community and us, the bi POC and literally sit down at a tabletop and have that uncomfortable conversation about these issues. This trauma related to oppression in the system and the white privilege, we need to discuss that. How can we black deaf, we've been suffering through year after year with the hearing world not accepting us and in the deaf world, not accepting us, not being appreciated in either world. And we're literally limited, squeezed into a small group. And that's a terrible trauma. Scores on us. And that hasn't been discussed yet. We really need to go ahead and take that opportunity now and discuss it. Because I want you to understand, and I want to be able to understand why the oppression continues to happen, why are we looked down upon? What kind of satisf satisfaction do you get from that? Is that some type of good pleasure? I'm really curious to know, th does it make you feel good and why? And it's really important for us to understand why you do what you do and why you continue to do that with the issues that are impacting us, the bi-POC deaf community. Now, as far as a Black person, we need to relearn and, again, reappreciate ourselves and re-identify in myself as a Black individual, as a Black individual literally finding a way to be comfortable um, with making myself, you know, be able to be trustworthy, you know, know that I'm human, same as everybody else. I'm intelligent. It, it doesn't matter, you know, there's still some type of being blocked, not being equal. And people feel like they're, they're just, all these different systems that are set up and, and policies, discrimination and it really continues, and then the inequality, of course. And then they try to call me or make me less than what I am. But the question is, why are you trying to make that way happen? And that issue of oppressing, it, like, like you're trying to just cause us to just stay in the system and be stuck. We really need to discuss that with the general population by POC people coming together and speaking through. As far as with the superiority happening in Africa, it's the same in 
you know, year after year, I've done different studies and I've come back here to America and I get the dictionary and kind of just go forth with it. And then I see that there's different labels when it comes to it. There's still that superiority. And then it's not necessarily trying to say that becoming an expert, but as far as one week and two weeks, a month in Africa, that's not necessarily becoming an expert. Th th that's not it. But if you have that attitude of being superior, superiority, then you will miss that, have that missed opportunity and assume that that's what that is. You'll be able to learn in that. And there, there's different levels when it comes to that. And how can we get the racism out? And that systematic oppression All of that has to be put on the table and discussed. And without that, this is going to continue with the same cycle over and over again. The same cycle, I promise you. And now you can see as far as we, the deaf black community, how we protest, how we resist. And people try to stop us. <clears throat> with the policies, laws, and whatnot, and that discrimination continues to happen. But each step of the way for BIPOC people will always, will always be in that resistance phase as far as always feeling that need to protest. And we won't ever feel comfortable until we get the business together and confront these issues that have been discussed, which have caused this anger and war that has happened in conflict. The protecting the deaf community, blocking the deaf community, it should be unity in this community. That's what it needs to be. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and take a break, and I'm going to let you all take some time for questions, and we can have an open discussion. Thank you. Hello again. Your presentation was truly powerful. That was really an impacting story. We have five questions from our audience. The first question is, Since more and more BIPOC people are now sharing their personal stories, will their stories help develop the curriculum in high schools and such on social justice for those students? So if it's included into their curriculum, well, it's not them necessarily the State Department of California that has the power to decide how to develop that curriculum. But with my opinion, if you want that, it's first, we have to make it clear, Black Deaf history just recently started, recently begun, recently started being talked about. These different schools, black of the deaf for black people of the deaf, there's three of them. And then there's Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, but there's others, um, Minnesota School for the Deaf, just different deaf programs that are out there. That was um, 
has not necessarily been researched on. There still needs to be more. Now the 1900s, the history started to become more prevalent. For example, the 1800s, we always discuss about the 1900s, how with, with deaf history and, and whatnot coming about. Yes. And oralism and depression and signing. That was the 18s. And when Helen Keller was born in the 1800s, deaf blind, you know, that was a celebration at that point. And then, so yes, there is def, definitely history connected from the 1800s. And then there was a gentleman who graduated from a school in Riverside in the 1889. And then the university, Shaw University was born was introduced. And then that is when um, the tests were taken and passed. But as far as being a qualified lawyer, he definitely was. But during that time, um, going to Gallaudet, he, he could, wouldn't be able to because he kept getting denied. That was his dream to go. So, He ended up going to another school, Ellie yeah. School, and it's only one person. The Roker, there's a history there of black deaf, with the deaf president now as well. And then there was black deaf blind, and then becoming a lawyer. That was very important, and it was re related with the 1800s. But yes. we are not, they all are that's, good. yes. So you can see that there is death history there and you can see that. So there's one side of the story that has not, but the other side has not been discussed yet. So my suggestion as far as de developing curriculum is to go ahead and start with the 1800s. Yes. Go ahead and start with, yeah. the, with the 1800, um, find out about those stories, the pain from that and confront them. And it's not necessarily, we wanna know the history the, and be able to confront that. The 1800s and what was happening during that time and then the, the 20s as well, the 1900s and the schools that were developed there with the president and how it grew the deaf president, but that history there is still a lot of work that happened. But as far as developing curriculum, I think the best thing to do is to partner with the institutions for the deaf and really yes. get out the information from there, really start digging, finding that history. Kenneth Ronawee, Wow, he is a fantastic person. Literally a lot of history, very important information related to him. Black deaf experiences, truly I had no idea and was completely amazed whenever I found out about that. I really respect the work there and respect the work that she, excuse me, has done. Yes, and I definitely respect and understand the responsibility that happened with that. And, and partner, it'd be best to partner with her to go ahead and get that history out. And that needs to happen now. First, there's American history, uh, you know, the 18, 1900s. There's the theories that happen after colonization. And that's related with the deaf Americans as well. Um, as far as with developing that community, there's many deaf institutes that actually developed during that period. And then that should also be related in the curriculum. And lastly, um, 
just sharing the pain with the history it, it can't just th- th- that that just can't just be what ha- recently happened it has to go back to the past and work its way up to now yes i agree we need to start from the beginning not just california but all over the united states we need to take a responsibility to dig back not just current history, but going all the way back. I agree with you 100%. So the second question we have, will you rewrite history in our current textbooks? (laughs) What do you think? What's out there? Will they rewrite it? Well, Honestly, if we really want both sides of the story, not just one side only, then yes, deaf history needs to be rewritten. We need the context, the history, the history of oppression of Native American people the oppression of the Latin American community, Spanish community, the 1800s, America, when they literally came in, whenever the, whenever um, colonization happened with, and then also just all the different states around the world really need to have that written and people out west been colonized as well. So if we really want to have everything relevant and relate, okay, think about the school for the deaf that was established in 1961, right? Around that time. And uh, what, 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 what was the agreement? What, what happened? Yes. 1861. Slavery had not even, ha- slavery hadn't happened yet. It was 1862, but there was still the civil war that happened. And then um, finally, well, I won't say finally, but slavery did in fact happen at that point around the 1860s. 1869, a few years after the California School for the Deaf was established in Riverside, there was a, a time period where we needed to move Literally, Black people had to establish their own school. Black deaf people had to establish their own school, their own way. It was literally a young BIPOC relating that was happening. The disconnects were were still there, but the deaf history books tend to put or leave out information related with the Black deaf experience in America. But the Spanish, um, Indian, Native American, just it's gone. The history is not there. There's literally few books that you can see. But even whenever you read through it, you don't see much about the Spanish culture and history there. there there's nothing there. It's literally just here, US. And it's been many years, the 19th century, we're here. And, oh, yeah. Um, so that's what I'm saying. So yes, they the textbooks really need to be revised. Really, truly do. Yeah, I think the obligation is with the Department of Ed to take on that responsibility, not just I agree for black deaf, but all of the multicultural oh, communities. Yes. I'm curious. You know, we've got the Asian, we've got the Hispanic, we've got the uh, all of the different cultures. It's very, very interesting. So yes. question number three. Okay. What tips do you recommend for those have yet to open up? You were just discussing the system of oppression and we need to start having discourse towards the end of your presentation. So what tips would you have for those people who have not yet um, expressed or opened up? 
That's really tough and complicated. It's a tough, complicated question. Oh my goodness. Think about the people who have been stubborn and have voted for Trump and have literally all these people who have died in America and just on and on and on. But my gracious, the change has to come with their mindset. And that's just how that is. I don't get it. I'm just going to be honest with you. It, it's really hard to understand that. I, I don't think resisting can change them. It really comes from inside the, the personal decision, their personal decision as far as what I wanna see, what I want as a human, what I would like to happen. Which one is it, equality or not? So maybe once they understand that, maybe they may go ahead and give up that superior attitude and go forth as far as trusting and understanding the other pers perspective of myself in my history. But the case is, my gracious, think about the school system. It, it started early with teaching. And then as they grow older, you continue to teach the history, both sides, the colonization side, and then the other side as well, both sides. And literally looking at both perspectives and getting a better understanding of both histories and getting them both taught if possible. And then the kids' future with growing up, white, white children will understand the rest of the, that will understand the other history when it comes to other humans and their stories, my stories. We can share together our stories and we can help each other with that confidence and build each other. And then when we become adults, okay, well, let me get to this point. It's really frustrating to me. I don't know if it's really necessarily, they just don't have any idea, but there's nothing about death slavery. Well, there's a little, there's a little there, but there's nothing deep and that tells extreme, the, what the history is related to death slavery. Right. So it's just important to be able to get that black deaf history out and how we were freed as slaved, slaves as well. Some people don't even realize that. My first impression was, um, I think it was a school, DES school. It was a teach teacher. Yeah, I had the same thought literally learning from them and didn't have any idea of what the knowledge from that history. That system literally cheats them and not allowing the opportunity to fully understand the story of all Americans. And if you notice that, many of them are more willing to join and partner with us if they understand more but we definitely want to get the truth out and no more lies. But, but one tip is really that um, it's the personal individual, their person, how they actually feel and their authority and their power and what they need to do. But one thing that I can tell you is if they are ignorant to the history because of the resources that are there, the books. There, there's plenty of different opportunities that you can go and educate yourself. Videos, everything. You can just only imagine all the information is available. So people that don't have any idea as far as what's going on, They're more lapsed, more relaxed. 
they feel like more crappy and like shit, you know, just kind of just on the inside, just not good. But as far as following that, we definitely don't need to do that. It definitely needs to be a resolved with that issue. And it comes to the individual resisting it. They have to be able to understand and not resist. And actually that's part of the problem. And the problem is we're not able to come together and it's still cracks after cracks, blocking and not having that unity in the community. But if we really cherish our community, then we will join, they will join us to fight that oppression. And if they don't, and they just wanna, you know, disconnect from that, then that's just that. Then we will definitely resist them because they're gonna try to oppress us. So we need a solution to be part of the solution and not be part of the problem, then you're saying. I agree totally. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, we do have three more questions, but uh, time is running out. So I want to ask the interpreters, are you wanting to continue or how you want these last three questions to go through uh, the chat or, um, so tell me how you would like to, uh, I'm checking with the interpreters. Uh, can we stay 10 more minutes? That's a good question. The deaf community is really complicated. We definitely know that. Not everyone is open-minded. And you know, California people themselves, they, you can actually remember that as well. <laughs> really. But um, some follow their family their ideas, sometimes they continue with that belief and they, you know, agree on that or they come up with their own ideas. But for us, being truly involved in the deaf community, it has to start with that discussion, with the issues that we have discussed from the past in the history that has to be put out. Those uncomfortable questions have to be put on the table and had an open, have an open dialogue. And then with by POC, let me give you an example when it comes to the Institute. It, it took some time with establishing and seeing their experiences, even at the Riverside or in um, it, it just trying to get those experiences to see what it's like. And just asking, you know, what do you think? What, what's different? Literally asking them and then get that explana explanation. Th th there's not necessarily needing to get frustrated, but definitely get that equality and try to understand why that's there or isn't there. And when it comes to the institution, there's problems that happen to be with access, with by POC, deaf access with the institution, by POC going into later into high school and they're behind. I terribly disagree. And I have noticed with by POC individuals, it's just not only one culture, but there's several cultures in one. Think about the Spanish community. It's not the same. 
and with the Latin, the Asian, black, you know, there may be Spanish, Mexican, Colombia, Venezuela, just all these different regions, countries, but the cultures are still there and understand that. The school, if the teacher is paying attention and, and taking up the time to understand each child and then their textbooks with the history there and have stories related to that history, then there could be a better understanding. There should be no more making of, of assumptions Literally, find out. With immigration, and taking that mask off of that, and learning more about that, understanding about their family, and even with their cultures and families, understanding them and taking that time to really understand the family, their experiences, what it looks like. Oftentimes in the Deaf Institute, the BIPOC, when it comes to wages, things are, it's missed when it comes to work and they have to go back to the institution, which is, far from Riverside and having to go back and forth to take the time off. And that takes money to do that, to have to go back and forth through those campuses. But why is the institution even thinking that they have to bring that, that community needs to be there in replacement? When it comes to the Spanish community or really any, there needs to be interpreters there parents so they can feel comfortable as well and their environment and their community. So whenever they go to the institute, the Deaf Institute, the teachers with the languages, sometimes they don't even understand and it's an, it's an embarrassing feeling. It makes you feel like a uh, you're not getting your point across. And like, they're just being the yes, yes, man. And it gets really frustrating. The literally thinking that they don't even care about your kids, but it, that's not it. it. And that causes stress on them. And then we definitely have to take that stress away, remove the stress. So there's deaf organizations. But to those events, there would only be uh, just a few by POC that would, that would show up to the event. And people would say, oh, we're so happy to see you here. You know, I'm glad to see by POC here, but that's just not our responsibility. That is the program responsibility to grab the by POC individuals to make it aware of that environment and open it up and friendly and welcome, open it up a friendly environment and welcome the deaf by POC to the events with no problem. We definitely need to revise and review the policies and the rules. They need to be revised, really take some time out, review of the policies, and, and see what needs to be involved, especially with by POC. The policies of America, it's still kind of discriminating. Right. Yeah. So we definitely need to change that. With the Institute, deaf organizations, deaf clubs, they need to take time to revise the policies and such. That needs to happen. That needs to be the priority, the first change. And then we will maybe see more by POC individuals becoming more comfortable to branch out more. But first, that has to happen. And they have to be willing to do that. Black, Spanish, Native American, Indian,
that 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 right there, if that's not opened up and discussed, it's gonna allow for the inequality to continue. And I've, that's definitely been recognized. And that's the center of the reason why that's continued to happen with those policies. They will continue to oppress. So reviewing the policies, revising them, figuring out how we can change, hire new people, resolving those issues. That's most important. So that's my tip. That's my feedback for the community. And all of that has to come with the right attitude, with the right open mind, with the right heart, and with uh, open eyes. So you need to have the right ingredient and have a person who meets all of that. Right. I totally agree. So before we move on, I forgot to ask you, are you okay with Going on a little bit longer, I want to be sure that I said okay from, I got okays from the interpreters. All righty. Okay, the next question is, so why would the new generation continue with the old ways and not just embrace the change? I'm not exactly sure about that because teaching justice, that definitely has been done with the oppression and that's general, generally oppression. And it happens with women, just in different situations at the same time for oppression. And Honestly, I've been teaching now for several years and I've noticed each, each step of the way with the students taking up my class, they're mostly white. And those students are already trumping they're excited about their futures. They feel very confident, trustworthy. They, they want to make that change. But now I suspect that's where this resist will come from with that change. Yep. The new generation, they're growing up and they're growing up differently. This world is different. You, there's, they're listening to black music. They have Spanish friends, you know, the diversity in the schools, it's, it's happening. And they, they're, they're being more open-minded, but understand, know that the kids who are born, they are not born with any type of prejudice, none at all. They're literally just a baby, fresh, new, but then they're exposed to the general world and their parents, of course, family members, the community, the school, and so on. And that literally trickles in and that's how those ideas are grown and stuck to them. So they're definitely, ex definitely excited and welcoming that change, getting rid of that old way, knowing that, that it's wrong. Let me give you an example. When it comes to deaf clubs, many deaf clubs have shut down. They blame the internet, technology, and different issues. But really, one thing that people don't wanna discuss, where are the deaf leaders at? W w that power that they're they're that they're giving up and passing down. Well, where is that at? Well, they like that control. Yeah, yeah. You know, they like to keep that control. So that's what I'm trying to get to say. That needs to be taken out. It, it's it, it needs to be a whatever type of thinking to just have new ideas, new generation. The resistance from that, that definitely is going to cause a change. All the young people in the audience, you can ask them, 
And they will say, oh yeah, we are definitely open-minded. We are willing to listen. We don't, we're not keeping that back from the past. Right on. So, so th their bag is light. <laughs> they're not carrying that heavy load. It has not even started yet. Th they're willing to have it open and revise the old and adapt to the new. The world is changing now and fast. The world is changing, completely evolving. And young people know a lot more than before. I think they're ready for a change. I totally concur. Some of them have already seen the generational changes. We have one CAD director who is eager to see things yes, move yes. in that direction so I can see changes happening. I agree. Oh, yes. Do we have any uh, other questions? Well, we have one last question. Okay. This person has visited various organizations and read their bylaws. One part states about planning on dismantling systematic oppression. How it works is they plan to recruit one by POC to be on their board. Wouldn't it be too much of a burden for just to put that onto one person? Would that be considered tokenism? <laughs> That's a good question. I really like that question. <laughs> no, it won't work it, 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 as far as a short answer, but um, it, it, it won't work. Let me give you an example. Maybe there's a board of nine, maybe 12, 18 board members, somewhere around there. And then they bring in one. Can one I'm right? That. So right. Oh, ratio. We need ratio. Yes, ratio. Yes, ratio. It's not balanced. If you have nine or twelve, there, there's. You know, nine out of 12, that's uh, the same. Still, for example, NAD. NAD has a very interesting history that needs to be revised as well. But NAD, when it was first established, there was nothing in their bylaws related to um, race. I think 1860, there was black death from NAD. They went to the Institute School for the Deaf and they started going to the meetings. The meetings or the conferences they would attend, but they would be kicked out, asked to leave. And that was puzzling because Gallaudet Association for the Deaf became kind of evolved into NAD. That language as far as being NAD wasn't there yet, but there were events happening and the Black Deaf were, had to leave, were asked to leave. And then they would add the white members. And of course, they would block the by POC members. 1965 was actually the time when finally the deaf black were able to vote. So with by POC, by POC, there was a conference, I remember, um, There was definitely different suggestions that happened and they were in agreement and saying, sure, of course, we'll make sure we document these down, put down all these information and get this taken care of. 
but there was no action. It was literally left lingering. But at Gallaudet, they did have a black deaf woman, Kate Brown. Um, she's a black deaf woman from Chicago. Really, she helped make that change. There was only one black deaf on the board there, but there was a change, an improvement that happened, improvement of life. Now, Glenn, she was a board member as well. There was an opportunity to work with the institute president and then have a place of access to be able to come leave and be able to come back. Now, during that time, there wasn't the right change that happened. And that was definitely recognized. There was a black woman who was hired at a location and they were able to work together and set up different programs. But now with bringing in a BIPOC, it definitely hasn't changed. In America, democracy, justice, right. that control, one person and then another, you know, 17 other white people, this one offers suggestions. And then whenever there's voting this happened, that's turned down. Now, is that racism? It's a free country. We can all vote and support. But being denied for that, you know, that, that's not right. That, that, that's racism. And there's no excuse for that. Right. So I suggest critical mass. Critical mass. Not one, five, seven, eight, ten come together and make a suggestion to that board. Now, how many Black Death recently joined? Mm, let's see, Glenn, let's see, Wilma, three. Two others that are hearing, two or three others that are hearing, there's no Asian deaf. There are some Native American Indian, yes, but Spanish, there's one, by POC in California, but that still isn't resolving it. Just think there's 18 people. That won't cause the change until we have equality. Meaning by POC, you know, if it's 18 total, there needs to be nine, nine and nine, half and half, half by POC, half the other race. There needs to be a balance. For example, with America, with uh, liberalism, that's not really happening with black death. It's not. It's increasing now with when it comes to women, but still, it, it, it's, it's not, it, it's not. And now I will call that tokenism. It's a bit sticky, yeah. though. It's a bit sticky. It just really depends on the perspective. If um, you ex if I expect you not to do anything, especially just be there, then then we're gonna count. Can you just count me? Then that's tokenism. But if you actually bring in someone who already is strong knows how to speak out, straightforward, knows about what's going on. They understand what is going on and willing to shake up and allow 
change to happen, literally get an uproar and, fi and not finding any excuses. There's different ways to get rid of or kick out that. But think about senior citizens and by POC, there's no change. Most of them already have their mind set, their specific job description on that person. And then putting in a POC or equal being able to have equal employment, they're definitely not satisfied with that. That doesn't mean that there needs that there's a change, that there's been a change. But people will say, oh, well, we hire, we've hired some by POC before. They're, we're not discriminating. There's some here that have been hired, but that's not the reason. That, that's, that's not enough. That, 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 it's that power. It has to change. And where do you see that problem? Well, it's more than just hiring one by POC person. There needs to be a diversity. Native American, Asian, Indian, not just one. That's the suggestion, to have more than one. It's like, how does it feel if I'm just the only black person and have all these the other employees of different race, as in white? That's, that's not making me comfortable. Oh, but if I see other by POC people there, I'm going to feel more comfortable. I'm going to open up, trust and probably speak out, speak up more, and it would help better. It would help the situation as far as confronting issues related to oppression. So right. no more being afraid. There's no more of that, no more fear. Get that out and be willing to make noise and unmask it. And I'm not BSing you but most of the organizations are afraid. And literally afraid of that uproar that could happen. But that's what's gonna force the change. Which one do you want? And that's what needs to be analyzed. They're afraid of the truth, afraid of the concepts, the common sense, afraid of it. But that's gonna force the change. And without it, there won't be it but they have to be willing to make that change and want that change and go ahead and, and go forth. And then it, 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 it's best to go ahead and take it now. We don't want it to later and blow up in your face. We wanna go ahead and take the steps to make that happen now. It really will help develop better policies and there will be a better successful way with that. Definitely will help with uh, organizational structures and help people feel safer and be excited about working with you. Definitely. I totally agree with that. If we can choose the correct uh, ingredients, like all the right mm -hmm. spices, delicious. And if the person can have all of these special qualities, we could go on in this discourse all night long, but unfortunately we need to close this. <laughs> it's been great. And I want to thank you so much for coming to our CAD platform. I want to thank the interpreters who have been supported by NorCal. Thank you so much for support sponsoring the interpreters this evening. And this platform was sponsored by on air productions who have run and is owned by deaf persons who own this platform. I want to thank everybody viewing in our viewing audience. I hope you brought home topics to discuss with your family, with your coworkers, and get these dialogues going, please, for the betterment of our next generation and society. So if you would like to see these platforms continue, please consider donating and visit our website. Thank you and good night, everybody.